I have as time to look at what the papers are saying on their front pages and we'll have joining us again uh, Dr. Constance Igogo, analyst, uh, journalist and uh, social commentator. Glad to have you join us this morning. Good morning again, Dian Minkechi. Well, to look at the papers this morning with us, we have Eniola Akinkuotu. He is the chief international correspondent of the Africa Report. Great to have you, Eniola. Well, he can hear us or he'll join us. Can you hear us, Aniela? Very well. Uh, okay, great. Hello there and welcome to the program. We'll begin with this day newspaper. In this day, Edun FG has exited ways, means, financing, says economic reforms bearing fruit. Then Tinubu were building robust financial system, business-friendly economy for foreign direct investment. In race for Edo governorship, six trends to watch out for. We also have a top story in the, on the website. Uh, we're going to be discussing that actually. Uh, it says, Minister Habs on Nigeria's strategic position as Africa's aviation hub. <coughs> the Minister of Aviation and Aerospace Development, Festus Kayamo, is confident that Nigeria can take advantage of its geographical location to become a central hub for air transportation in Africa. I mean, while this is a fantastic vision, it requires much more than talk. It will require world-class infrastructure, I mean, optimal services to handle, you know, high number of passengers and, and cargo traffic, and also for airlines to be able to service their fleets uh, with ease. Um, any other? what do you think of this vision? Yeah, I mean, so I'm getting some feedback here. Um, I, I read it too this morning. I think it's quite um, it's a lofty uh, plan, but I wonder how Nigeria seeks to achieve this goal. Um, you know, every country that has become an aviation hub has its own uh, national carrier. If you look at the Ethiopian Airlines, which goes to over 100 destinations every day, they have their own flag carrier. If you look at um, the UAE, it has uh, the Emirates Airlines. If you look at... Um, um, what's the name of this country now, uh, the UK too, they also have there. So you need to have uh, this national carrier at least for that to even happen. And then you have to look into the ease of doing business in your country as well. Remember that some airlines complain that there are about 32 separate charges that they pay in Nigeria. They said that Nigeria is one of the most expensive places uh, in term to operate in terms of aviation. You know, you also have FX issues. We have dilapidated infrastructure. In fact, right now, I think it's only one or two airports that are economically viable. That's the um, Moitala Mohammed Airport in uh, Lagos State, and I think, uh, of course, the Namdi Azikwe Airport here in, in Abuja. All the others are more or less um, just cosmetic uh, projects. So I don't, uh, you know, for, for your country to become an international hub for aviation, you have to invest heavily in infrastructure in the, uh, in the airport as well. Yeah, at least yeah. right 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 i mean i flew through doha airport recently i don't know if any of you has ha, has done that that place is massive the amount of passengers the kind of traffic that it handles the kind of infrastructure um the efficiency levels i mean it's not a joke being a hub is a serious business for serious people indeed doha dubai you expect that Dubai has, I mean, become a tourist attraction for the entire world. But they work but, towards but that. Of that's course. the point. Yes. Of course. Of course. That's what I'm saying is become, why did they become? It was mm -hmm. because they worked. It was because they had a clear vision of what they wanted to do. Now, Kayabu talks about uh, geographically how we're situated, very poignant, fantastic. He talks about potential, but you know, like Enela just said, we don't even have an aircraft. So is it a question of just wanting to talk. National airline, not yeah, aircraft. Yeah, I mean, national airline. It's not a question of just wanting to talk. The thing is that when you're talking, what do you have on ground to show for it? It might not just not be about Kiyamu or this present government, but over the years, we know what transpired when uh, the former aviation minister, I cannot remember his name now, Hadi Risika, was there. Sirika. All the All the stories, all the back and forth, and... And then Nigeria, as big as we are, we still don't have a national career. Right. That is a disgrace, simple. Right. Okay. Well, it's possible, but you have to work for it. Let's look at New Telegraph. 
In New Telegraph, Edo Guba campaigns have ended. INEC tells parties as brothers go to war. Edo Nigeria now records monthly net inflow of $2.35 billion. Digital transformation, ICPC recovers stolen $4 billion naira within 24 hours. And then Tinubu shells 76th anger to tackle domestic issues, directs Shatima to lead the Nigerian delegation. His decision was made known in a statement by Presidential Advisor on Information and Strategy, Bayo Ananoga. I mean, this is probably a good resolution in light of the fact that he just returned from China and United Kingdom, two trips, and Onga is next week. That's the United Nations General Assembly meeting. Aniola? Well, that's a lot to unpack there. But um, yes, on the issue of Onga, I think it's laudable if it is followed through. Um, you know that the president received a lot of flack uh, some two weeks ago when he was in uh, China and all these uh, disasters were happening left, right, and center. And of course, that was when the petrol price was also increased and then the dam disaster in the Bono state. So I think it's laudable because the, um, the um, agents, the government agencies that are projecting that you're going to have more floods uh, when the Lado Dam is open and uh, the Onya Dam in... Uh, in around of the state is also open. Uh, so the president uh, he says he wants to be around to coordinate and to make sure that things go well. So I think he, he deserves a lot of commendation for that if it is followed through. Because um, you know sometimes they make announcements and don't actually do it. But if it actually happens, then it will be a first. I don't remember the last time a Nigerian leader didn't personally attend the UN General Assembly to deliver his own address. I don't think it has happened since 1999. I need to check. Uh, but if Tunibu is shelving it uh, in order to, you know, monitor and ensure that things go well in the home front, I think he deserves commendation for that. Uh, Nkechi, this is a force in this administration. What do you think? I mean, optics are important. He, the president has been tagged a globe trotter. And so I think it was important for him to shelve this trip. You have Bayonanga, his spokesperson, putting a key factor on this decision on the recent floods. However, the president, the administration, they've been facing mounting pressure domestically on so many issues, economic instability, inflation, uh, growing public dissatisfaction. And so the optics for shelving this trip, sending the vice president instead, just sort of shows that he's ready to roll his sleeves and focus on what's going on in Nigeria. Well, let's uh, hope he really ro rolls up that sleeve. I mean, that's the optics. <laughs> and one just hopes <laughs> that it is not about optics. Right. Okay. Uh, let's look at Vanguard newspaper. Edo um, governorship poll credible. People are hoping that Edo governorship poll will be credible. That's a day to go, is it? Yeah. Yes, it's tomorrow. It, yeah, that's tomorrow. Less Just than a, a day to go. Well, less <laughs> than a day to go. So all eyes are on the Independent Indeed. National Electoral Commission to conduct a credible poll. All eyes will also be on politicians. Security yes, politicians to behave themselves too, Eniola, isn't it? Well, I'm just hoping that their election doesn't end up uh, in violence uh, because of the rhetoric. You know, there's been a lot of bile from all sides in recent times. Of course, you also had the PDP refusing to sign the uh, peace accord. Um, when you have this sort of atmosphere, what happens most times is that it affects voter turnout. And in the whole world, Nigeria comes number two in terms of uh, the lowest voter turnout after Haiti. That's according to st um, several statistics. Uh, and the last election, that was the 2023 election, general election, the voter turnout was just about 27%. And uh, Yaga Africa said in a report yesterday that about eight local governments, you know, identified eight local governments as hotspots. And Edo has just 18 local governments, so almost half of the local governments, they've identified them as hotspots and um, things could happen there. So we're just hoping that this doesn't affect voter turnout. We hope INEC will be professional because there have been allegations too that, of course, the Resident Electoral Commissioner there is a cousin of Wiki and is his former appointee and could do his bidding. But INEC says, look, they've put things in place to ensure that there's credibility. Um, the police too need to be professional. I think they said about 34,000 policemen have been deployed. Uh, so um, also we ask, we call on the political class too to please, you know, shove uh, violence because, of course, you know that they are the ones that are always thinking of how to beat the system each day. So we pray that uh, everything goes smoothly and we wish the Edo State uh, electorate well. This is an off-season election. 
And so there shouldn't be any excuse at all. All attention is at Edo for tomorrow, Nde. Yeah, uh, Ayala has just done what Khan is doing. Khan prays for peaceful polling, uh, which is fantastic. Fear of outbreak, he talked about it in Edogar government areas by Yaga, you know, and then APC is crying that the suspect who killed the police should be arrested, you know. And then Aziebwemi, the chairman of uh, PDP, has given already Aine kudos for he was at the CBN when they were picking up the material. I said they did a, they did a good job. But I think along the way there was uh, a, a fracker said there, they dropped the ball, but that he hopes that they will continue in that line. And then, of course, uh, we expect security agencies, INEC, to be neutral. This is coming from LP, and that is what everyone expects, whether it's off seizing or on seizing. The most important thing is that INEC does its work. INEC has always talked about the fact that, or people, commentators have said, INEC is not particularly the problem, but security agencies, and then the knack of politicians to try to circumvent the rules of the game. Right. Let's look at daily trust. A mid-degree flood, victims if dilemma after discharge from camps. We also have a vision comes through as boni scholars return home to continue uh, or contribute to your base development. There's a scholarship granted to some citizens of the state. But let's settle on, on the flood. Um, as the floods recede in Brownu State, the problem now is that people are released from the camp to return to their homes. However, there are no homes to return to for some families because it's been washed away by floods in addition to their livelihoods also being destroyed. So this is a difficult time for the state. There is a lot of money that is pouring in into uh, Brownu State. Yesterday it was reported that at least 11 billion Naira has been pledged to the state in order to help them to handle the situation. But um, it's not an easy time for the governor and the people of uh, Brownu State. You, you would expect that this money is uh, um, managed uh, carefully and properly, Aniola. You know, Bonu State is one state I pity so much because of what it has been through for years. I think uh, in the last 15 years, that um, state has, uh, you know, uh, faced insecurity challenges. It was the epicenter of the Boko Haram uh, insurgency. Um, I mean, over 800,000 people were living in IDP camps even before this flood happened. And now, you know, people are saying that it's going to even increase after this uh, disaster. And um, now, again, we're hearing the Lagdo Dam is going to be open soon. So I, I don't know. I really pity them. Um, kudos to all those who have made donations. I mean, all the, um, in fact, even of members of opposition are also making donations and all that. I mean, everybody is just trying to pitch in, which is good. But how is this money going to be spent? I was reading somewhere that the money's raised so far is over 5 billion naira, you know. Uh, how, do, how is this money going to be spent? Is it going to be you know, spent judiciously? Uh, you know, and what is being done to ensure that this sort of thing doesn't happen again? And, and I mean, lastly, we know that there were warning signs about this dam. Who are those found wanting? How is it that there was no maintenance and all that? So uh, I, I just hope that things work out well for that state. It's just, I mean, it's just so saddening. And of course, you remember that um, um, the prison, one of the prisons there, so over 200 people escaped. Most of them are still not accounted for. And who knows the kind of people who have escaped could even worsen the insecurity in that state as well. So it's just saddening, really. Kachi, you know, for the governors, uh, you know, Babagana Zulum, nobody wants to be in his shoes today. This will certainly test his leadership. Definitely. And, you know, you have that balance where government trying to clear the camps However, homes, a lot of homes are still knee deep in water and people don't have anywhere to go. It's not even just home. We have uh, graveyards oozing toxic fumes. And so you could just argue that this flood and has, sewage and sewage as well, system. this flood has unearthed just more than environmental problems. It just exposes a deep inadequacy of uh, the state's ability to provide sustainable disaster relief. So no matter how much money that people are donating or other states are donating to that particular state, if you don't have that uh, disaster relief uh, sort of management system already in order, it will be difficult to balance it. And yes, so Zulum's plan 
to stem whatever is going on in the states is going to be one to look out for because people are so deprived in their state. You also have people taking um, uh, palliatives or food men for people in the camp and they've been stealing it. That's also another report. You have people coming by from other regions and disrupting uh, the palliative distribution in the camps even. All right, let's look at the, the international headlines for you. Daily graphic from Ghana. EC won't compromise election, Jean Mensa. Here, the elect Electoral Commission in Ghana is pledging that elections coming up in December will pass the test of transparency and integrity. This is what citizens want to hear, isn't it? It's important for them that there's a level playing field, Eniola. Oh, yes. I mean, um, the EC in Ghana, in recent years, they've been receiving a lot of commendation. I mean, the last election in Ghana had about 78% voter turnout. Um, and this year again, they're even projecting it's going to be higher. Uh, so far, you see, they have they don't have as much electoral violence as they have in Nigeria. So, yeah, I think they're doing well. Um, right now, the battle is mainly between Bawumia, the vice president, and uh, John Mahama. And of course, most people are even projecting that Mahama is going to win, who is an opposition person. And if the opposition is able to win again, it adds to the credibility of the electoral system too. So let's hope that the EC continues to you know, uh, live up to the billing. Right. On to the Delhi Mirror this morning. Al-Fayyad rape scandal. 20 women alleged they were assaulted by the late Harrods boss. Abuse cover-up claim amid fears of at least 100 victims. I mean, so many papers have this. We also have, um, let's see, uh, the Metro, Al-Fayyad a serial rapist. Um, where, which other paper do we have it on? Um, citizen has it. Right. The Mirror also has it. We've just talked about the Mirror. The Shop of Horrors, it says on its front page. So this story is according to a documentary that was made by two women. And so it, it alleges that all these victims are coming out. They were terrified to do so when the man was alive because he was considered a very powerful man. And they also worked under him, so it was difficult for them. Then after his death, this is you know, all coming out. Um, Harrods uh, uh, has uh, released a statement saying that uh, they've made changes. This is not who they are. But um, you know, it, it, it's a tough one because out of 100 victims, there has to be some of it that are through, although the man is no longer here to defend himself, uh, uh, indeed. Yeah, uh, it, it's, uh, I wanted to use the word, it, it's interesting on the basis of this having been discovered, even though posthumous, I mean, the man is dead, died at age 94, sold the Harrods at 2010, and then these allegations are coming out. Uh, lawyers are also investigating what are possible claims could be made against the Metropolitan Police by people who said they reported their alleged abuse, but insufficient action was taken. So that's a lead to the fact that there was a report when this incident is were occurring, but that the police may be culpable. So we watch out and see what plays out. Fayed is a very, very... Um, uh, Popular family, well, I strong, mean, very, influential very family in the, in, in, influential yes, person. So in the United Kingdom. So you can understand when people say that when he was alive, the fear of even saying that, and then the question of belief and his long arms, you know. So we see, we just hope that he's dead, so he's not talking, so we're hearing only one side. But we'll hope that investigations go on, and then the question would be, do you now sue Harris to court? Because I think there are new owners or something. What do you do? It's 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 dicey. I don't know how to go go, go about it. Well, Kechi, this also shows the level of sexual harassment that women have to face at the workplace. These are similar allegations with um, uh, Sean Diddy Combs in the United States of America, the entertainer, you know, who has been accused of. Um, uh, racketeering, you know, organizing prostitution rings and things like that. He is in court. He denies all allegations. But you see this again and again. Yes, I think it's the same story. Money, influence, fear, creating a force field sort of around these powerful men that makes it almost impossible for justice to sort of break through, which is why it takes these victims a long time to actually step up and speak out. We've seen it in Harvey Weinstein, Jeffrey Epstein. Now, this al situation sort of cuts deeper because it suggests that even institutions such as the Met, 
the Met Police may have been complicit. Uh, there's a story of a young girl uh, at 15 years old. She said that when she reported, the Met leaked her details and her case was then quietly dropped. So just imagine this sort of trauma of abuse and then a system that... And there were that, private settlements also. Exactly. And then a system that sort of uh, pressures victims to allegedly not speak up. So this Al-Fayed... Uh, situation or development is very interesting and cuts deeper uh, as we look at the documentary. All right, finally we'll look at the Times newspaper. Hezbollah tells Israel it faces harsh punishment. The Hezbollah leader spoke for the first time yesterday following two days of blasts in, uh, in, uh, in southern Lebanon, be believed to have been masterminded by Israel. It's yet to be seen what this punishment of Israel will be and how this will change the dynamics in the region. Uh, already Israel has indicated it's ready to uh, go on war on this particular front, you know, regarding uh, Lebanon. Uh, and Yola, what are your thoughts on this? War is going to be unending, for God's sake. Um, this latest offensive by Israel, they said I think about uh, over 30 people were killed, including two little children. And so you have Hezbollah saying they're going to revenge. And at the same time, um, members of the UN Security Council, I think they met in France yesterday, or maybe they're supposed to meet today, to see how they can de-escalate tensions. But, I mean, with both sides still spinning out this sort of rhetoric, I don't know what's going to happen. It just doesn't make sense. Next month is going to make it one year that the, you know, the whole Israel-Gaza thing you know, was reignited. It's almost a year, and you know so many people have been killed. And now both sides are still saying <laughs> the more are going to be killed. Now uh, Hezbollah is being drawn into it directly. Uh, you have, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, what's the name of these people to um, the Hamas too? All of them are just sort of forming some sort of collaboration against Israel. So I, I don't know how this is going to end, really. It's just uh, this happening. You know, when you thought that, okay, maybe things were going to change and then things just continue to escalate. The other situation in the middle is, uh, I'm afraid that's all we have for the paper review today. All yeah, right. Nice Thank you that. so yeah. much, uh, Dr. Constance Ikoku, for being here with us. Thank you, Mr. Akinko, too, also for joining us in our offsite studio. That's all the time we have here on Daybreak. Up next, it's the morning show. I am Kichi Nana. Thanks for watching. I am Ndi Amo. Bye.